and we're live. Welcome to another Juju Office Hours for Friday the 13th, the best day of the year. This sounds like a good time to do a release check status. <laughs> so uh, what are Juju Office Hours? It's where we get together once a month, or actually bi-monthly lately these days, so twice a month, once in a European-friendly time zone and once in an American-friendly time zone so we can get everybody in there. And it's pretty much a just come hang out, We'll do Q&A. We'll give you statuses of what's going on in the Juju community, sexy new bundles that we're working on, um, new bug fixes, new things that we're announcing. So it's kind of like if you had to follow one thing and the mailing list is way too boring for you, you could just subscribe to this channel by clicking below and kind of get um, get a status on what's happening in Juju land directly in your YouTube feed. So my name is George Castro. We, we have a ton of stuff to get started today. So we're going to start off with Marco Cepi is going to do a release update. Then we're going to talk about big data. We're just getting back from ApacheCon. Um, so lots of good information there. And then we're going to go right into QA with Merlin on the reactive framework. So with that, Marco, take it away. Cool. Uh, normally Cheryl does these updates, but uh, since they are all busy preparing the next beta release today, um, she was able to join. But she's giving me the lowdown on a couple of cool things coming out in beta 7. They're hoping to release today might be early next week instead, depending on how all the testing goes. So, um, with that, Beta 7 has a couple of key features coming down. The first one is MAS 2.0 support will not be behind a feature flag anymore and will be ready for general testing. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. Using those two new products in concert with each other will be super cool to see. Um, and then, finally, the other thing that's major to note of is that there'll be changing some of the CLI still. Um, so for instance, instead of create model, it'll be Juju add model. Um, outside of that, there'll be a bunch of new bug fixes as well as some new features in there. So look for the release email either tonight or Monday when they have beta 7 out released. And that's it, huh? All right, moving on. Corey, we sent a bunch of people to ApacheCon, and there was a bunch of community people there. I know Alexander was there. Kind of, can you give us a story on what's happening and what's going on in Big Data Land? It feels like we haven't seen you guys in a long time. <laughs> yeah, we've been we've been pretty heads down, and unfortunately not doing a, a good enough job of talking about uh, what we've been doing. But we actually had um, Sam gave a, a demo at uh, ODS as well that I'm going to touch on real quick before I get to the ApacheCon. Um, so let me just do my screen share real quick, and I'll try and get through these quick because I've got quite a few uh, different tabs here. So the, what you're looking at here is um, they did a, a deep learning uh, demo, um, and this was for intru network intrusion detection systems. Um, so this bundle uh, using the NVIDIA CUDA and uh, the deep learning for J uh, was a is able to train a system to detect network intrusions based on log, log information and, and so on. Um, so that was pretty interesting, and they, they demoed that at ODS um, two weeks ago, I believe. And then this is the bundle that you would uh, potentially use in production um, to actually do the uh, detection. So the first bundle was the training bundle, and this is what you would deploy in production to actually analyze the logs that would make use of the uh, training data from the previous one. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I, th I think that demo went, went well. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't, wasn't able to attend that or the... Uh, Apache Big Data. Um, so moving on, uh, at Apache Big Data, we, this is uh, Mark Shuttleworth um, giving his uh, presentation on um, Juju uh, and Maz. Uh, his, his presentation focused on using Maz to um, get metal-like performance uh, with Juju to get cloud-like uh, management of your big data solutions. Uh, that was uh, pretty, pretty well received. Um, Pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Um, let's see, moving on. This is Antonio um, giving our giving a presentation. This was a more of a deep dive into uh, charms uh, and the, the big top uh, big data uh, bundle, which I'll get to uh, more in a minute. Um, this is talking about uh, the different relations, and uh, that was a more technical deep dive uh, presentation. Also went over well. Um, and Kevin, who uh, was not able to make this meeting, uh, <laughs> gave, uh, he called it the uh, dumb ops uh, presentation, um, talking about why uh, our infrastructure can be dumb, but our um, 
you know our solutions don't have to be. So that was uh, that was pretty awesome um, and uh, humorous and well received as well. Um, we also had some interesting call outs uh, at Apache Big Data uh, from people outside of uh, Canonical, uh, which was awesome. We had um, this, I believe, uh, was um, someone from NF Labs or something. I'm not positive who, who gave this presentation, but this was retweeted by uh, someone from Pivotal um, talking about how with Juju um, deployed on AWS and doing some, some tuning that is not available with EMR, you can actually get uh, two, two times the cost savings, um, so twice as much performance per, per dollar. Um, yeah, I think that is uh, Alexander from uh, NF Labs. So um, he he also had some uh, interesting hallway conversations about um, about the mo starting to move forward with the um, Zeppelin, uh, the new new Zeppelin uh, notebook that uh, they're working on uh, that has, I believe, multi multi. I'm not sure, uh, multi-tenancy or something like that. But um, so they're going to work, start working on charming that. I think we're going to work with them closely to get, get that. Uh, but I think they have a pretty good idea of uh, where that's going to go. It's pretty interesting. Um, this is Tom Barber from uh, Meteorite BI um, showing off the charm code that he used to deploy uh, DCOS. Um, that uh, looked pretty awesome from what I uh, saw. Um, and you can't really tell it here, but uh, Tom was uh, rocking the the Juju Charmer Summit shirt uh, to Apache Big Data, so that was awesome. Um, so that is what I have for Apache uh, Big Data. Um, unfortunately, like I said, Kevin couldn't be here. He was the one that actually attended, but uh, he's traveling right now. So um, the stuff that we have been working on recently that we have not done uh, as good a job as we should have talking about, so I'm going to talk about it now is uh, Big Top. Um, we've been uh, working on uh, developing bundles and charms. Uh, we worked with uh, Constantine from uh, Big Top uh, to develop these uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, they're coming along very nicely. We've got a bundle. We're actually working with them uh, right now to get this in, um, in the Big Top upstream repository as one of their uh, official ways to deploy uh, Big Top, and I think it'll. And we're also uh, integrating with them to to use what we're calling the weather report, cloud weather report, to give uh, information about um, you know performance on different clouds and reliability. Uh, we've got a really uh, nice um, page that kind of shows the the summary of the results and um, and the benchmark results and everything. So uh, this is the processing uh, the Hadoop bundle that we're working on with them. Um, so that's that's really exciting going forward. Um, we're also uh, putting the finishing touches and trying to get the uh, a, an update to the uh, vanilla Apache bundle that we have had for a while. Uh, this adds a lot of monitoring and um, uh, HA uh, and upgrade support. So it'll be a lot more resilient, a lot more uh, introspectable, give you um, a lot of interesting uh, information about your deployments, uh, what we're calling our production-grade uh, offering to make sure that it's really uh, excellent to use on in production. Um, and then finally, um, the Spark, uh, our Spark production-grade bundle uh, uses the new Belk stack, um, Beats, Elasticsearch, uh, and Kibana. And uh, that also is HA, um, so and supports uh, upgrade actions. We're again putting the finishing touches on these, but that's going to give us a, a nice uh, mirror to the uh, Hadoop production grade bundle um, using a different stack that has uh, a different, uh, more kind of polished um, monitoring interface. What do you got, uh, George? Uh, yeah, we got a question from uh, Merlin. Is uh, is the idea to switch completely to the Big Top charms at some point? We we are not um, we're not getting rid of the vanilla Apache charms, but the focus is definitely going to be uh, more on the Big Top uh, charms because it allows us to leverage all of the awesome work that the Big Top community has done um, and uh, reduces the maintenance burden on the charms, allows the charms to be uh, m much more focused on what they uh, bring to the table, which is the um, connectivity and the operations management and the intelligence around you know. Uh, you know, scaling your deployment, uh, failing over, um, you know, providing additional actions on top of the, uh, on top of the deployment, 
uh, relating it to other services, enabling other other uh, services to use and uh, hook into the, the big uh, big data um, bundle very easily. Uh, so that's what we bring to the table, and that's what we want to focus on. So it makes a lot of sense to uh, let the big top community focus on uh, you know managing and deploying uh, and configuring the um, big data components. Um, and we focus on the operations and the stuff that Juju does really well. Uh, it also allow, will allow us to uh, much more easily uh, bring uh, into uh, availability the charms for the components that BigTop already has uh, managed, and there's like uh, 15 uh, or even, uh, as many as 30 of them that uh, our base BigTop layer allows us to really easily just say, well, now you deploy this BigTop component, and we can focus on just the uh, logic around connecting that component to, to other things and third-party services. So it makes a lot of sense for us to focus uh, much more on, on that. Um, but uh, as it stands, we also have a bit of um, feature. We're short on feature parity because we put all this work into the HA and the upgrade on the vanilla Apache charms, um, and the pivot to Big Top is relatively, relatively recent. So we've got to port uh, all of that uh, work over um, to, to bring the big top back up into feature parity, but we've already got the basic um, basic deployment working, and um, I think it's going to be a, a much faster path moving forward. So it's going to be, I think, really good. All right, that's all I had. Any other questions? Yeah, that's really interesting. Just pass me along the links to all the bundles you showed, and I'll make sure I'll put them in the show notes. Uh, so those yeah. of you following, check, click the links below. Um, so you can check out these bundles for yourself, and as always, you can deploy them on any cloud that Juju supports, which is all the big ones. Okay, with that, we're moving on now to... Uh, that's it. We're going right to the reactive Q&A. Um, so this started off as a discussion on the mailing list about reactive, and we decided to move it here for some high bandwidth reasons. So I don't know who wants to... Who wants to uh, um, maybe I should give an introduction to the discussion? Yeah, or a summary as well, so if everyone yeah. can yeah. start, that'd be great. Yep, so take it away, Merlin. So the discussion is mostly about the, the um, changed states, like config changed and um, file changed and stuff like that. Um, I've been seeing that there are some problems with, with the current behavior. And the discussion is mainly about how to solve these problems. And the, 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 what I propose is to, to make a clear distinction in the reactive framework um, between what is a state and what is uh, an event, where a state is something that, that handlers, they set a certain state, and that state will not be removed unless a handler removes it. And an event is something that just happens at one time, and if at that time there are handlers um, that 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 react to that event, then they will be queued to be um, to be run, and afterwards the event um, disappears again. Um, yeah, so that's that's an interesting idea that we've kind of talked about. Um, I think even ever since uh, Ghent, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, I on the one hand, I agree with you that there are there are some things that we kind of want to behave in that fashion, like config changed, like um, um, th things like watching for file changed events, um, if we wanted to kind of model that with states. Uh, things like that. Um, I, unfortunately, Ben uh, couldn't be here because uh, it's a little bit early for him, I think. Um, I, um, but we we had a discussion, he and I, um, and he, he kind of convinced me that uh, he thinks that we can model this um, purely with states. Um, and from his point of view is coming from trying to, to look towards the future where um, the reactive um, dispatch loop is not part of uh, a charm per se, and not part of, uh, in particular, a particular hook context. And um, so the the 
problems that you note, um, I, I think, stem from the assumptions that we made early on in the development of uh, the reactive, since we were working within a context. Uh, and we kind of had this this idea of, um, you know, there was this, the start and end of the of the hook, um, which don't really make sense in the in the future looking um, way that we we wanted to go, and it led to some uh, unfortunate decisions. And one of those unfortunate decisions is that uh, if you currently, if you remove a state, it causes um, all of the currently the the set of currently matched handlers to reevaluate their conditions and possibly drop off, and that leads to a lot of uh, unfortunate behaviors that you noted. Um, I think that from what Ben described to me, we can model uh, if if we do away with that one behavior um, and make it so that removing states, um, just like adding states, doesn't affect the set of handlers until all of the current set of matched handlers is uh, evaluated. Uh, it means it would mean that um, that we could model what what you're describing as events with just the pattern of uh, a state sticks around until a handler explicitly removes it, and any handler that is watching a state that is supposed to be ephemeral uh, has to be responsible for um, removing that state. So um, how that would work is you have two two handlers that are watching for, uh, for instance, a config changed uh, state, um, and that that state gets triggered when a uh, when the reactive system detects a config change, that might happen from a hook. That might happen from you know something out of band. If we have uh, something a bit more advanced than um, you know the reactive living inside a hook context uh, that we have now in the future, um, so the config changed state would get set based on the actual config being changed, and then all of the handlers that could respond to that at that time get queued up, and then they all say that they have processed that state and it should be removed uh, when they're done. And because uh, they all still get evaluated, um, it would behave exactly like you described in that the state would be processed by everything that could handle it then and then removed and nothing else down the road would, would be triggered by it, which would fix, I think, uh, the behaviors that you would, uh, the problems that you're running up against. And I think the, the benefit of doing that, that that way is that we don't have to kind of distinguish between these two types um, and everything can just be modeled with this one idea of state and it's just, it, you know, how, how it works depends on how you use it. Um, and I, I think there's some benefit to that. And I, I think there was, Ben had some other benefits in mind that kind of work uh, better with the more future looking um, system uh, that kind of uh, enables um, you know, access to the Juju model from things that are not necessarily purely uh, charms uh, or uh, purely, um, you know, in, in a hook context. Um, and that that's sort of, so I think, I wish you were here to, to kind of give a better idea of what this, yeah. uh, um, what this would uh, involve. But I think the idea is basically that um, that there'll be a a, an external process that's running that's kind of managing that that dispatch loop, um, and it, it has no notion of of hook context. It just has notion of these events, you know, get triggered by certain certain things, and that dispatches and um, uh, dispatches the event handlers or, or the state handlers as as appropriate. And one of the nice things I think that that does would enable us to do is if is have um, nicer language bindings. Um, for other languages. Right now, the, the Python language bindings and the, the bindings to, to bash and external handlers uh, works, and it works uh, pretty, fairly well, but there are, there are some idiosyncrasies uh, because of it, because of how it's, the, the Python is more of the first class citizen and the, the external handlers are kind of uh, not shoehorned in, but um, you know, they're, they're kind of outside the, the Python um, a dispatch loop, so it makes it a little bit less clean than it could be otherwise. So, um, I, I feel like I've monopolized the discussion here. Merlin, do you want to have do you have a response to that? Yeah. So, um, first of all, if if we could solve this problem without um, adding a new a new 
like adding events, that would be even better in, in my opinion. Um, I, I understand the idea of the external um, state handler thing, and that that would that could give very big benefits. Although I'm not so sure about um, not retesting the queue. I think retesting the queue is is something that's very important um, in order to make sure that um, the order in which handlers are put on the queue, that it doesn't matter. So a handler, all the um, all the, the preconditions, so all the states that a handler reacts to, they they should still be um, should still be true the moment when a handler runs. So for example, if you have a handler that reacts to a certain service being running, and the code in the handler is written so that it would crash if the service wasn't running, well, this handler, if if this handler would be put on the queue after a handler that stops the service from running, then that handler would crash. But if the handler would be put on the queue before a handler that stops the service, then 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 the then the, the run would 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 be fine, would continue. And so the the problems you're getting there are bugs that will be very hard to to find, very hard to debug. And um, from a from a purely theoretical standpoint, this this stems from the 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 reason that the the, the preconditions of the handler are not you, you cannot be certain that the, the states that the handler react to that they are true the moment the handler runs. They could be true, but they won't be in they won't always be true. And I think that's a very bad way to to go about it because that will mean that a handler will have to implement logic to see if the states that he react to are still are still valid the moment when he runs so my my response to that i think would be that um, in in a lot of sense uh, the handlers are going to have to implement those the, those kind of guard clauses regardless because for instance the if if the handler is going to crash if a service is not running, um, then even if a handler that that um, stopped the uh, service didn't didn't trigger um, something else uh, external to the um, to the handlers might have triggered the the service to stop. It might have been done manually by the uh, by the operator, and I think that the handlers have to have to kind of be aware of those those things. Um, as far as the states themselves. Um, I think the idea was that uh, state um, mutation would not uh, commit; it would be kind of transactional until um, you know all of the the current set of handlers have been uh, evaluated. So, um, in the state system, each handler would would see the same state as what their precondition, what they saw when their uh, preconditions were tested. Um, obviously, that doesn't handle, uh, as you said, it doesn't handle. Um, external things, um, but I think that the handlers kind of have to be aware that uh, anything that's external to the state system could potentially happen external um, to any of the handlers regardless, uh, and so handle uh, be aware of that. And the, the problem with um, the way that we currently uh, do the re-evaluation, um, you know, one second, uh, Matt, the, the problem with the way we currently do the re-evaluation um, is that uh, we only reevaluate the queue when states are removed, um, and now that we have um, a fair number of you know whens and when not uh, different operators, that means that there's a, a an inconsistency or an asymmetry there. That adding states does not uh, reevaluate the queue, but um, removing states does, and that leads to very very subtle um, issues. Um, Matt pointed out that uh, some visualization would help. Um, but uh, I'm not sure I have a good one. Do we? Are you wanting to uh, show what you have there on the screen there, Matt? Do you want to talk about what you have? Um, so Matt's yeah, got. Does this help at all? Um, I don't know if it will, but does this help? Like if you set, and then maybe talk about what would change or what what you're proposing. 
So what I'm proposing basically is that uh, any any state mutations, any set states or add states done within a handler um, would not um, mutate the state as seen by other handlers until uh, those handlers have, have had a chance to do, to kind of react to the, the state of the system as it was when they were queued, uh, when they were, when their tests were evaluated. Um, and so they would they would see this, the state of the world according to states um, as the same as what their uh, their test conditions were, even if there's uh, an amount of time that was uh, that transpired between when the test was uh, made and when the handler was actually invoked. That that would be the same like um, what's what's the the behavior now with hook runs that when you do config config get on a hook then you know that at a certain point in the past the configuration was that value but you don't know if it's still that value in the present the same with a relationship like relationship get when you get a value from relationship get you are sure that at some point in the past that was the value for that relationship but you're not sure it's in the present and so what you're proposing is to have the same the same behavior um, during the run of the reactive framework, like until the queue is completely cleared and new handlers are put on the queue. Right. Um, but the yeah. So the the di difference here, I think, would be that um, we may we would have to make a distinction between um, between the, the states themselves and anything that's kind of external. So the the states the states would be um, Transactional, um, but uh, we—I mean, it, it's impossible for us to control the fact that there are e external things that might um, might change or mutate. Um, and since our, uh, you know, since our test conditions are purely driven on the states, um, which is uh, another point to uh, we we talked about the or I mentioned the uh, file changed uh, decorator. I think I think that we. Uh, and think that that needs to go away, and instead of instead of do, having a specific file change decorator, that would either have to be managed um, by a state. Something would have to watch for that file change and, and queue a state, or um, we would just have the handler do the the check uh, more explicitly inside the handler, which I think makes sense. But um, so the anyway, the idea was that the um, the states are. Something that we know we have control over. We know that uh, they can we can consider them um, transactional, um, but the handlers have to be aware that anything whenever they're dealing with an external system, things can change. You know, in the middle of uh, a handler uh, running, uh, for all we know, and there's nothing that we can really do to control that. So, yeah. So um, your earlier point about um, that. Um, handlers only get remove, removed from the, from the queue when states are removed, not when new states are added. Um, in, in my opinion, this should be changed so that when, when any precondition of a handler um, becomes, becomes false, when a handler is on the queue, then it should be removed. So that when a handler uh, reacts to when not a certain state and the handler is put on the queue, when that state um, um, becomes active, then the handler should be removed from the queue again. Because in, in my opinion, the, the, the preconditions of a handler, its, it's state it reacts to, they, they should be true the moment the handler runs. Because that was the, the problem we had with the hooks, that each, each uh, function you make has to do has to have a lot of logic to see if certain things already happened, if certain things are active, and what what I thought was the the idea of the reactive framework was to to remove that to have like this 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 knowledge base this this database full of states and these states they represent the current um, state of the system, so a handler knows that if it reacts to certain states. Then, then he knows these are going to be true. So if you apply that to, for example, a service that is running, um, 
there, there should be a plugin that plugs into to system D, for example, that sees that, that looks if a service is still running. And if a service is not running anymore, then the state that the service is running should also be removed. The same with, with any external um, event. So I, I think the, the transactional um, approach is, is a great way. But this transactional approach, I think it should be at the level of a single handler. So that during the run of a single handler, the states do not change. But after a run of a single handler, like time, time continues again. And then all its changes get applied. And then the, the system looks if certain external events have happened. So that the, the, the review queue, the, the queue can be retested. And an, another thing is, for example, um, this, this, this system would not only be, be handy for when a, a handler um, reacts to, to a service that is running. For example, one of the one, one handler that, that a lot of people use is a handler that restarts a service when certain configuration values change. So when, when this handler would be executed, when the service is stopped for a certain reason, then the service gets started at a moment where, where it's not allowed to start. Because when, when, when some handler stops a service, and the next handler restarts the stopped service because the next handler thinks that the service is still running, then you also will have a problem. So I think the, 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 the list of stuff that, that the, the, the list of handlers that, that are not allowed to run when its preconditions are, have changed, when the state of its preconditions have changed, is, is I think very long. And I think it's it's intuitive for people who write handlers. They 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 think logically that all the states a handler reacts to that they will still be true. So the big problem that I see uh, and have seen with um, things from the the state mutations not being transactional across uh, the the queue um, is that you run into. Uh, the problem of starvation. You have um, handlers that uh, the, the state gets into, uh, the state of the system reaches a point where they should run, but something else happens to run before them, and they then, and changes the state, to it, and at that point they never get to, to execute. So you'll, you'll see inconsistent behavior where, depending on uh, the order that handlers happen to be executed, which we're saying is undefined, um, a particular handler may or may not run for no apparent reason. Yes, you are, that, that, that's a very good observation. And um, it's, it's true what you're saying, but I think the important part here is that, that these inconsistencies you are talking about, um, certain inconsistencies like that will still happen if you don't retest the queue. The, the restart example is, is one of those examples where inconsistencies will happen depending on in what order the queue is executed. But when you make sure that the preconditions of a handler are true the moment when the handler executes, then you, you are 100% sure that then people who write a handler can react to those inconsistencies. But when, when, this, is, when this cannot be true when it's possible for these preconditions to not be true when the handler executes, then the person who writes the handler, he has no way of, of um, making sure that inconsistencies like this, that, that they don't affect the handler. So the, the person writing a handler, he should think about those inconsistencies and he should define, define inconsistencies like these in the, in the states that the handler reacts to. Except that, um, except that it's more consistent if if the queue is transactional because you can you can consistently say if if a given set a given state is reached 
this handler will be run. And from that handler's point of view, it will see that the state of the system is, is such that it is allowed to run um, as long as its state only depends, or its conditions only depend on state. Um, and uh, the other way around, you you have inconsistency in, in that you never know if your if your handler will be able to be run um, because it might be it might get preempted by uh, a handler in another layer um, or looking you know even further forward um, if it if the system shares states with with other um, portions of applications or what have you, um, it, it may get even preempted by something that's not even a layer that you necessarily brought in. Um, so Do you have examples of this? Because this is the behavior that I actually want. So do you have examples of this, of where this behavior is, is unwanted? Um, well, the, the, uh, the current example is the file change decorator. Um, when, because that suffers from this problem, if if something uh, if something removes a state, um, and and that one is is a, a bit m more of a bug, but um, when something removes a state, the file change decorator can get dropped off the queue because its its state now um, doesn't uh, it gets retested and the state of the system has mutated such that it's no longer applicable, and you end up with with this handler not being run when you expect that it should have been because you saw that the state of the system reached a certain point uh, where it was valid for it to run, but then it never did. Yes, so that that is the... I think that that is not a problem. Um, I think that problem does not stem from retesting the queue, but I think that problem stems from that you are um, th that you are approaching this file changed which is actually an event as a state. So I, I try to explain this a bit in my email, that um, when a file changes, the, the state of the file is not that is had, that is had, has changed. The state of the file is that it has changed into something. So a, a state is something that you can make untrue. So a file change state, the only way you can make it untrue that a file has changed is to revert the state of that file. So file changed, if, if you would treat it like a state, then it should only be active, then it should only become active after the first time a file changes, and it should only become inactive when the file becomes com goes back to its original state. This is the same for every other state, for example, um, 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 for example, service, uh, a service that is running, a service that is running, the state can only become inactive when the service is stopped. When the service is restarted, the, the, the service does not, um, um, the, 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 the service is running state does not become inactive. So this, this is, I'm, 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 not really, I'm not saying that we should have um, the, the concept of events in the reactive framework. I'm just saying that um, treating file changed as a, as a state is, is wrong. And the, the, the problems you are having stem from that um, thing. The other problems we are I'm not sure. Can I can I jump in real quick though? Uh, I'm not sure that I I agree though because I I think that the the state is not that uh, is not based on the contents of the file. The state is based on the file has changed and that change has or has not been processed by the system. So the the yeah, state is yeah, added. That's so that's the difference between states and events. So. A state is a state that, that the server is in. An event is something that has to be processed. Right, but but my point is that the um, the state of the, the file having been changed, if it is not processed by something, that should not go away until something it can reasonably say, okay, I have acknowledged that this that the file has changed and I've either done something or not. We can't we can't know that just because the the preconditions uh, haven't been met that the fact that the the change 
has occurred uh, is no longer relevant. I think it, that it's. I think the point is that Ben was trying to make is that we need to be explicit. The handlers need to be explicit about saying, "Okay, I, I have acknowledged that uh, that has happened, and now it can go away." Yes. So that's that's something that I totally agree on. But um, even in that way, even if you want that behavior for states, you do not want that behavior because if something reacts to its state, and if something reacts to a state like long, long past when it's 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 got into that state, then it will still be able to do that because the state will still be active, which is not the case with the, the changed event. So if you would want to solve that problem by using states, then you could have something like each changed each file changed event has a timestamp on it. Then you could have a state file changed at this time. And then you could treat these 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 changed events as states. Because what you are saying is, is, is true, that some handlers want to react to the, the changing of a file even long after the file has changed. But that does not mean that, that the, the state becomes inactive. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying that we should, we should treat states as states. And so if you, if you do not want to include events in the reactive framework, then we should just try to solve this problem using the, the, the concept of states, the state of your system, the state of your server. And if, if, if you want to, I think if you want to, to make it very user friendly for people to react to a file that has changed in some place, then you should start thinking about separating the state of a system from stuff that happens to the system, from events. So separating states from events. My my point though was that it the file file changing is is not an event. It, the file the fact that the file has changed and it has not been handled is a state, and that state is going to be true up until something handles that. And if if that has been if that's handled immediately, then it goes away immediately. If it's handled uh, down the road, then it then it goes away down the road. I don't I don't understand why you think that um, the the fact that I, I think I think maybe there's a disconnect between what we're consider what we're what we're envisioning when we say state, um, perhaps. Uh, yeah. So from my point of view, the reactive framework is a rule engine, a rule engine that has a knowledge base. And this knowledge base is full of facts about the system, and and each each rule um, has certain preconditions. That when those preconditions are correct, this rule has to run, and the rules can change the state of the system. So this is how I look at it. I know that that um, your your vision of the reactive framework um, it, it stemmed from from something else. It's it's stemmed more from state machines. Uh, well, I've I've kind of come come around to your to your point of view where uh, the states are this the, they're they're not the thing is they're not states of the of the system as in the machine. They're states of the system as in the the reactive um, the reactive system. And in that in that case. Uh, something like you know file change is you know that that's something that becomes true and stays true up until it's processed or otherwise acknowledged. So I, I, I again I don't see where something like events would come in. We don't we don't want that to go away implicitly because we're saying that you know just because uh, you know nothing is currently capable of handling that. Um, it, it, we're going to lose that knowledge uh, automatically, and I don't like the idea of that yes, piece of knowledge I'm, dropping out. I'm, I completely agree with you on that. I, we completely agree. I think we completely agree on uh, what the problem is. I just think that the solution will not solve the problem. I think the problem stems from the fact that so if so, what, what you are talking about, the state that you are talking about, is not 
that a file changed. The state you are talking about is that a file changed event has not been processed. And that is a state that can be in the system. And so that is, like you say, a state of the reactive framework, that a file changed event has not been processed. And so if you would implement it, if you would want to implement the functionality you want in states, then that would be the state that the, the system has. And so if you, if, you, if you define it in that way, then it, then it will also become clear to, to people who are programming in that way that that, that, that happened. But, but still, if you want to do it in that way, then I still think it is, it is, it is wrong to uh, not retest the queue. So if you want to have the behavior you, you, you are looking for, then you should have file, um, file changed, uh, not handled by this handler. This is, this is the state that you want to react to, that a certain file changed and that a certain handler has not handled the, the, that specific file changed event. So if, if you would be able to, to implement that in a way, then you would get the functionality you want without having to um, without having to not retest the queue. You can still retest the queue, so you can still have the advantages of knowing for sure that when a handler runs, that all the states it reacts to are still true. And then you wouldn't have to um, add the 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 event, uh, the, the the sense of events in the system. But I I think. In that way, it, it becomes more complicated for developers. But if, if you want to implement it using states, then, then I think that would be the best way to do it. Because then states, then you treat everything as a state and as a fact, as a fact in the knowledge base. And then you, you don't, um, like, magically run handlers when, in, when a state isn't true anymore or then you don't re magically remove states from the system automatically. So are you following that? I, yeah, but I still, I still disagree with you because I still think that having... Um, the, the problem is that if you, if you reevaluate every time, then you have the problem where um, handlers Certain you, you can never be guaranteed that a given handler will have a chance to run, and uh, but it might, and and that inconsistently inconsistency seems seems really bad to me um, because it's really hard to to program around within the handlers. Yeah. Uh, on, on the other hand, if you if the state of the system is transactional across the set of um, handlers that have matched, so at each at each time. Uh, the system checks the state um, and queues up every handler that um, that could potentially uh, that that is valid according to the current state. Uh, those handlers then run in any order, um, and they any changes that they want to make uh, to the state of the system are deferred. Uh, that way, any handler will still see the state of the system as being valid for for their preconditions. Yes. And then uh, at the end, once all of those have had a chance to do their thing, um, then the state mutations are applied, and then all of the uh, potential handlers are, are rechecked to see if, if the new state uh, ch means that other things can, can run. But it, it guarantees that any handler that, uh, who, whose, pre whose conditions uh, are valid for the, for the state at the time that they are checked um, you do get a chance to run and can't be preempted by by some other handler mutating the state out from underneath them. Yeah. So I I, I also understand what you're getting at there, and and I, I completely agree with you. But the 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 thing is that um, you are you are um, so what you are describing is a life cycle. So you are describing handlers as um, different actions in that life cycle. That is still the, the state machine approach, where you go from one state to another, and in, in, in your 
in your view, then it's a set of, of substates. Uh, the, the global state is comprised of a set of substates. And in order to get from point A to point B, all the states in between have to be um, have have to be um, um, you have to go through all the states in between. But this is not how a, a, a rule engine should work. A rule engine only works with that that um, the 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 current state of the system has to be handled. That's how a rule en engine works. And so if, if the current state of the system is a certain state, then a certain handler will have to run. And if if, if the if if you get then then the, the state of the system changes and that will mean that certain other handlers would run. So the 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 issue here is that, that you are you are um, um, combining the the idea of life cycles with the idea of handling how the system currently is. So the a, 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 a practical example. A practical example of this is that uh, when a file changes while a service is running, then the service has to re has to be restarted to um, to 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 like load the the new configuration file. And so the handler you would write is if the service is running and if the file has changed, then the service has to be restarted. But if another handler stops the service before this handler has run, then this handler should not run anymore. Because when the service is stopped and the file changes, then the service should not be restarted. So you should look, um, you should see handlers as um, things that handle the current state of the system, things that run to handle the current state of the system. You should not see them as steps in a sequence to go from point A to point B. Because if you think about handlers as steps in a sequence to go from point A to point B, then you're talking about state then you're talking about state machines, about automata. And well I, I think I think that our vision originally was for this to, to be um, more of a state machine than yeah, a whole engine. Yeah. Um, and, and Merlin, if I could step in there, um, yeah. I mean, I don't think the the system is sophisticated enough to know um, if if that service is running um, at this point. So, I mean, I don't think we could we could legitimately model something like that for for system D, for for Docker containers, for upstart. I mean, I don't think we have those those features to tell the the system if if a certain process is running. You know, and there's also there's also the case where you've asked the process to start, but maybe it errors out or it failed to to come up for some for whatever reason. Um, you 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 can't. I mean, the system, the reactive system, wouldn't know that that, that you know that the uh, service is down or it you know. I I I I I tend to like the state machine better because it's easier to to understand because you control the states. That you're going to see in this system, if it was a rule engine, we we would have arbitrary um, arbitrary rules that may be evaluated or are not yet implemented, right? Like let's say we're on a on a on a Docker uh, container system, and and the rule engine hasn't been updated to tell to 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 query if if Docker containers are running, you wouldn't get the death of that service as as an, an event. And therefore, you wouldn't get. It would be incomplete compared to a, you know, another uh, set of services like Upstart or 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 System D. So, I mean, I, I think I think I do like the state machine because it's easy for me to know that when these states are set, and I'm or I or the other layers are the only ones changing those states, that that is the that is the the, the state of the uh, the system. Rather than these these arbitrary you know plugins that may or may not be implemented at this time, um, you know, I think that makes for me it makes more sense being a state machine rather than the rules engine. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, it's a, a very popular opinion. There's currently okay. there's currently not 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 a single configuration management type system 
that, that is built like a rule engine. And I think that's a pity. <laughs> I think the, <laughs> the, the reactive framework, uh, as it was originally built as a rule engine, is something that is extremely good in what, in, in what Juju is doing. Because when you, when you do the state machine approach, then you will have to know each state beforehand. This means that if you have a certain service that can have, uh, that for example has 10 possible relationships to other services, and it can have any different combination of possible relationships, then you will have to have a different state for each possible combination of services. And so that way you, you, you create a very complex state machine that, 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 that is, is, is very in, inflexible and, and that, that, that is very hard to handle the, 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 dy the, the, dynamic, uh, the dynamic aspect of Juju. Juju is, 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 is very good in having a dynamic infrastructure with lots of services that can be connected to lots of other services. And this is where the state machine approach falls short. So if you take the, 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 the rule-based approach, then the only thing you need to know for your handlers is that if certain, um, if certain states are true, if certain facts are true in my system, for example, somebody will some somebody said that they want to connect to me using the MySQL interface, but I didn't start a MySQL server, then I have to start a MySQL server. So that's a handler. A handler says that if this stuff is true, then we need to change something to the system to make sure that the system is back into a consistent global state. And this means that completely independent of what other relationships this service could have, if it has a certain relationship that wants a MySQL interface and it, it didn't start a MySQL server, then it will do that. And so then you have... But, but a question, so what if, what if the MySQL server could never start? What if there is a, a problem with configuration and it keeps crashing? Wouldn't this system go into an infinite loop or to, to keep trying to start it and then check to see if it starts and try to start it see if check to see if it starts yes so if there is a state that a developer of the handler um, did not anticipate then you you will have inconsistent states then you will have problems but this is something that you will have anyway in the state machine approach you will have the same thing if that if a developer does not think that a certain combination of substates is possible, then you, you will have a problem in the state machine approach. In the rule-based approach, you can just say that these things have to be true in order for me to be able to, to, to perform this action. So for example, the configuration files have to be a certain way or the configuration files have to be present or my SQL server has to be started and I can only run this action if all these facts are true and so in this way you can create a handler that even though you don't know the global state of the server it will still only run when it can run because you described when it can run can I can I jump in real quick? I just had a thought that um, I, I you know I'm I'm not sure at this point that um, that your assertion that if if we um, make states mutation transactional that that necessarily means that we are um, describing a state system. I think what it what it seems like it's more accurately describing is is actually a um, a rule based system where the rules uh, can be triggered in parallel. So what what that means is, or what I'm trying to say is that um, by making the state mutation transactional and executing every handler that matches um, a given uh, state of the system, we're eff effectively trying to uh, simulate that those handlers are 
um, executed all at the same time um, with the uh, underlying conceit that, you know, computers are inherently um, uh, sequential and not parallel. Um, but I think the idea that we wanted to get at is that the handlers, um, you can, in, they're not just that the order is indeterminate, but that the, the that they're actually, in a sense, executing in, in parallel. That's a very good idea, and it's it's true what you're saying. Um, have you have you been have you seen the 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 MGMT uh, tool? It's 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 a, a conflict management tool that has been released. Um, I, I think while we were at the Juju Charm at the Charmers Summit. So this system um, this uh, implements that idea. But when you do this, then you have the problem that um, all handlers cannot be dependent on each other. Because if a certain handler runs and it does something, for example, it, it installs an apt package, two apt packages cannot be installed at the same time. So these two handlers have a dependency on each other. But what, what, what the MGMT system does is um, it defines all the actions that can happen to a system and it defines dependencies between these actions. For example, if a certain handler um, depends on a certain package being installed, then while that handler is being run, a handler that, that removes that package will not be able to run. So if, if you want to, to go the approach like you were saying, then you then you start to to go to to the MGMT system, and then you will have to have a way. Then then it would be best to have a way to describe dependencies between different handlers, so that instead of having to write in each handler the logic to check if everything he depends on is still true, then you can just be sure that you can run run two handlers in parallel. But it's not I think, I think that the, we have a, an approach um, that kind of addresses that, and I think that's the the approach that Stuart has come up with, with the the apt layer, um, and the the way that he got around that, or the way that he handled that uh, difficulty, is that he um, he made it so that you you tell the system I I would like to have these packages installed, and that becomes a a state that uh, is now in the system. Uh, or, or it becomes a state once once you're done uh, with your set of handlers, um, and so the um, the handler that responds to the state that there are packages that have been requested to install can now see all of the packages that all um, previous handlers have requested and install them all um, at once. And any handlers in in this um, in this round of uh, handlers that that would be in parallel are just going to be requesting new packages, for instance. So we we use the the states to kind of communicate um, between handlers so that there there aren't any uh, cross dependencies. And I and I think that has been shown to work in the in the apt layer. Um, and I think it's a reasonable approach. What do you think of that? Yeah, yeah. It's 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 true that you what you say that this solves that problem, but. Um, this solves that problem because all um, all actions that can be done on apt on on dev packages, all actions that use apt, they are all done in a single handler, and no other handlers does anything related to apt. It only communicates to that handler what it has to do, and in that way, you are sure that there will be no uh, dependencies between handlers because you you just isolate handlers. So if you would want to go to that approach, then also, for example, uh, putting a service down and changing a configuration file, and everything would have to be done in only one handler. But the, the, the problem that you, are then, that you then will have is that um, a configuration file can be changed while an app package is installing. As long as the app package is not installing um, packages to that directory, for example, so then you will never have the ability to parallel uh, handlers that do things 
well, in, in parallel. And then you go back to the fact that you have you have no way to run any handler that, that, that changes the system in parallel, and you then you basically have the the, the approach that, that I proposed to, to keep um, to keep retesting the queue because no handlers because every handler can change something on the system and we are we are we are not sure about any handler if it can run in parallel with another handler. So what, what and, and, uh, I think if if we want to if we want to address this problem seriously and if we want to address this problem in a way that 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 would be good for the future, then we might be able to go to the MGMT approach that we have certain resources, for example, apt packages and files, and these resources they they describe certain dependencies between them, and handlers they communicate to these resources and they use these resources and then the reactive framework um, um, knows knows for certain which handlers can be run in parallel either du either during during a transaction or um, really real time in parallel or not so what do you think of that approach uh, yeah that's that's interesting and, and I think it's something that we should look into I, I really would like to have uh, more this is more of this discussion and in, in, in particular that uh, possible approach with uh, when Ben is available because uh, he, he's really the uh, the idea behind this and I'm I'm trying to trying to argue from from what uh, he explained to me and I'm not I'm not sure I'm getting all of the nuances and everything so I, I really feel like it would be good for us to maybe reconvene or have another discussion on this uh, with you uh, and Ben um, so that you could uh, discuss it more directly with him because I think I think that that it does seem like an interesting idea and something that we might want to explore. But I think that Ben will have um, Ben will have some inputs on this. Um, uh, do we know if Ben is going to be um, available online? Maybe we can do another hangout uh, today. I know it's a, getting a little bit late for you and it's a Friday at Berlin, but uh, do you think you might be available for another uh, couple of hours if we can? Get another hangout going with uh, with Ben to continue this discussion. Yeah, that that would be possible. Okay, um, if if not today, um, maybe then next week, uh, Monday or so. Um, okay, I, I also noticed that we're. Um, I'm not sure what the the allotted time for this. Way over. Way over. It's okay, it's okay. It's only nine. Not a big deal. Yeah, it's it's really hard to get West Coast and. On European time, uh, but I'm sure we can work something out with Ben. Um, but I'm thinking we should wrap it up, and then we could continue that. And then uh, I say, you guys, it'd be nice, I think, if we could record that also, and also toss that in the channel. I think it's something. Yeah, I was gonna say, hang out on air for that would be awesome as well. Yeah, yeah, um, and I'm available to do that if you guys want, or or Corey, I don't know if you know how to do a hangout on air, but I can show you how to do that. It's not a problem. Um, so with that, that kind of um, concludes office hours for this week. Um, let's look at the calendar because I know we like to pick, we like to pick our office hours ahead of time. Uh, when are you guys thinking here? Uh, towards the end of May, probably. Yeah, either like the twenty seventh or the third of June, maybe. Let's do June third. Try to get a full two weeks in there as well because um, there's also isn't now that um, Apache Con's over yeah. isn't big data something happening this week where Alexander and some other guys are at so and it's Chuck's birthday so we're gonna make him run them on his birthday because we're there. <laughs> okay all right so let's shoot for June third I'll send the particulars out to the list uh, we'll make this one friendly for the West Coasters and then uh, for everybody else. Uh, thanks for listening in. If you if you lasted all the way to the end, and please don't forget to subscribe by hitting the button below and checking out uh, links of all the bundles that uh, Corey showed off today. And with that, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Merlin, for dropping in. Definitely a great discussion. And bye. <laughs>